All right, we'll start the next talk here. Uh, just a quick reminder, the talks, uh, if you're just coming in now, you missed them. Uh, Todd is in the back, he'll be selling them throughout the day, so you can pick up any of the talks if you missed it or something you want to hear again. They're available for sale. Uh, both bars are open, uh, thanks to our sponsors, so please, if you want to get a beverage, grab or a soda or whatever it is you want, the bar has it. And I guess without further ado, let me welcome Daniel Beaver to the stage who's talking about weaponizing your coffee pot. Cool, cool, cool. So our agenda for today, pretty simple. We're gonna talk about the, so this is not about coffee pots or about coffee at all. This is more about connected appliances. So we're gonna discuss the landscape, where's it going and why would someone want to attack it? We'll look at two different products and then I'll wrap up. So first off, my name is Daniel Buentello, or Daniel B. I like to debunk magic. Uh, and as you can tell, I'm starting to learn how to put things back together. I work at Alert Logic. We're a security as a service provider, and we are hiring if anyone's interested. So now the, the cool stuff. The Internet of Things. So when I started this, I, I kind of wanted to, I'm a bit dramatic, so I, I thought, what's a good way to describe what I'm doing? And weaponizing a coffee pot was, you know, on the dot. A coffee pot, it's pretty much anything connected, right? The, their CES this year, there was all about putting your door lock on the network, putting your thermostat on the network, putting your lights on the network. And that's really where this all started. Uh, but you're telling me, Daniel, they've always been able to connect, right? We've had these protocols, ZigBee, Z-Wave, and X10. But the big problem with that as a vendor and as a consumer is that these are closed systems, right? My phone doesn't speak ZigBee. My laptop doesn't speak, speak Z-Wave. I have to buy like a dongle to do that. And that's not cool, right? As a vendor, I want to reach the most users, the most the high adoption rates, and I want to make it kind of you know, transparent to the user. And for that, you need TCP or TCP IP. That's really the internet of things. Uh, you're gonna be able to reach more users and it's be more convenient. My, my iPhone speaks IP, my laptop speaks IP, and this whole controlling thing, it's transparent. It's also uh, cheaper to manufacture. So now, like with our first target, it's a $12 chip. It has Wi-Fi built into it. Uh, and like I said, this cheap prices allows anybody, and when I mean anybody, like a door lock manufacturer, can say, hey, you know, this high tech startup is doing door locks, I wanna do that now. And that kind of naiveness is gonna cause problems. It's also easy to develop. So it's either Linux or embedded Linux. Uh, so it's not gonna, it's a low cost to get in. So you'll be able to see more of these products uh, on the market. So yeah, expect growth, everyone's doing it. And that's sort of like the mindset these vendors are gonna have is, hey, this, this guy's doing it, why can't we do it? And it's, you know, the formula's pretty easy. You're gonna slap the stack on it and add the four C's. So uh, what are the four C's? Well, your product, you're gonna prefix it with connected. Then you're gonna market it as being convenient. You're gonna make sure to say that it's compatible. And if you can, throw the word cloud in it. And I wanna kinda show you what that looks like. This pencil, it's actually not really a pencil. It's actually our new connected pencil that uh, we leverage cloud technology and made it convenient to all of our users. But the best part though, through our relentless engineering, we've actually made it 100% compatible with all notebooks on the market. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, why would I want to attack it, right? I I'm a malware guy, I, I like doing bad things. Well, because you can't just take your light bulb to, to Geek Squad and say, hey, I got a virus, fix it. One, how do you know you got a virus? Two, how do you even get it off? There's no uh, user interaction, there's no antivirus for this stuff. Uh, with your phone, if you get some malware, you're gonna expect some feedback, and maybe you can uninstall or you know, reflash the device, but you can't do that with a light bulb or with a thermostat, or at least not easily. So essentially, if you can compromise this hose, this is like a, a mini computer, and it becomes a, a fly on the wall. You can do some man in the middle if you want to. Uh, you can make it persistent, so like, if you remove the antivirus or the virus from your computer, you can have your thermostat attack it again. Uh, or a botnet, right? If these are, like I said, computers, do whatever you want. So when, when I started out with this, I wanted to, to define what is weaponized, right? What does that word mean? So I said three criteria. The first is I want this to be stealthy, so don't break the device. We, we, don't, we want it to keep the core functionality intact. 
Uh, so don't make the user aware. If it turns on a light switch, make sure it turns on a light switch. Lethal. And by this, I don't mean kill, kill somebody. I mean make it do whatever you want. Uh, if it controls your light switches, make it control, uh, control that function or do whatever you want. You know, two years from now, you might hear some hacker group turns off half the country's light bulbs, you know, some, some sort of attack. And I'm actually going to show you that in a, in a little bit. So persistence is a third quality I look for. Uh, I want this to be persistent. I don't want it to be easily removed. And, and really that's inherent because there's no interaction, like, like I mentioned earlier. The user can't go to add or remove programs and take it out. But this also, in a way, you're, you're thinking, this makes it secure, right? Uh, we are the most dangerous plugin after all. Not us, but in people in general. We're the ones who install 10 toolbars. We're the ones who click on everything we can see. So this, taking this away, technically should make us more secure, right? And I, I illustrate that right there. Uh, I got to see that a lot when I was working at TechBench. People said, hey, clean my computer, click here. And, and this is sort of a, a trap for vendors. They're like, hey, this doesn't have a keyboard and a mouse. We don't have to worry about security. Uh, it's a fallacy. Uh, they don't have things to click on, but that just means we have to think differently in the way we attack these devices. Uh, and we, we have this already. We have multi-stage malware. So you can click on a, you're on your computer, you're navigating some site, and it downloads some Trojan or some malware, and it scans your network for these devices, and it you know, moves from your computer to your thermostat. It moves from your computer to your light bulbs. So I did something. Okay. Uh, and you're seeing this this year, I think there's some talks on uh, hacking Samsung TVs. It's been out for a couple of years, but I think the person who's doing it now is making it to where, like, you can have your TV spy on you. So you can tap into the camera of your TV and, and, and see what's going on. So our first target. Uh, so who here has one of these or knows what this is? Anybody? Okay, a couple, a couple. Sorry about that. So this is a Belkin Wemu, and it actually controls your, your light switches, and uh, you plug in, actually it controls anything. You can plug in a heater, light, uh, a lamp, and what you're gonna see in a little bit. And what I figured is that they control the on and off in the application software, software not in the firmware. So the first thing I, I did was see how fast it can go. And th this was kind of very dangerous, and I'll show you that right now. Uh, but I was like, man, what if someone could do this remotely? So the next thing was get some remote shell. Um, it had no telnet, had no SSH. So my goal right then was to build Netcat for it, have it reverse shell, or in inject it at startup, and have it reverse shell to my host. Uh, so for that, building Netcat was kind of a, uh, a task, because you can, if you have a complete tool chain, good, do that. But a lot of these people are not going to have that. And you can, naive me, I tried, hey, this is a GPL violation, you know, give me a tool chain, give me some something. It's not going to work, they're not going to care. So uh, Kimu, Kimu is your friend, use that. Uh, you can virtualize a, a MIPS machine, build your netcat on there, and then move the binary to the host. So that's what I did. Yeah, I, I built netcat on a, a, a virtualized MIPS machine. So that's some, something that you would probably try to do, and this is what I did. I, I wait for it to boot up, and then keep on trying to reverse shell back to me. So I can uh, initiate this on and off remotely. Uh, for that, though, I needed a way to update the firmware, and, and I found this vulnerability, in which we'll look at in a little bit, uh, that allowed uh, someone from like a computer to tell it where to get the firmware and there's no there's encryption but that's about it I mean you just hey go to this spot get your firmware and trust that it's legitimate and firmware modification unfortunately I can't go too deep into that in 20 minutes but it's not anything new uh, if you ever rooted your phone you were doing that except the Android platform has a bunch of security mechanisms and this doesn't have anything and if you're interested, the, the proof of concept of the shell and the rate limiting is uh, at that link. So I want to show you a video of, of what I saw because when I saw this, this kind of what motivated me to go further. Uh, so some precautions. So the clicking sound you're going to hear is the relay going on and off because the light, now I'm, I'm going to put the mic near it because you might not be able to see the lights blink that fast. Uh, it's going to ramp up faster, 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 then pause and then go full speed on and off for about half a second. And I did this, I did this with the light. Uh, but again, imagine this being a space heater or, I don't know, people plug weird things into light sockets. So just, you know, use your imagination. And for anyone that uh, has problems with strobe lights or anything like that, please be cautious. This is caution. You know, this is going to, uh, might bother you. So, so I can show you that right now.
I don't know where my spot is at. Um, Hopefully y'all can hear. Yeah, so that was pretty bad when I saw that, and that's really what I was like, man, this is horrible they're not protecting these devices. I mean, this could be anything. So back to my slide. So some notes about the Wemo platform. Its firmware is actually encrypted. Uh, the problem is, is they put the keys, both keys on the device itself. So not just the keys to decrypt it, so the device can know what it is. But how do you get the keys out, right? I mean, like what keys first, chicken or the egg? The firmware's encrypted, I can't get to the firmware without the keys. Well, you start with hardware, and I know that's kind of bad, but uh, there's some uh, shell access through hardware, and uh, there's a cool trick. You can shuffle stuff in, so with embedded hardware, a lot of times you're gonna have read partitions only, but you're gonna have to have a read and write for like the, either the web server for things to get updated, like settings or whatever. So shuffle stuff into there and then go to the website to get it out. And that's really what I did. I got the keys, you can get binary certificates, anything. Just copy it into this partition and then go to that address. And this is what the firmware vulnerability look like. Um, right here you see where you can put your bad firmware in. And then it's a SOAP message. So you send it to the device and that's where it can go and retrieve the firmware and it'll update itself. Uh, there's some CRC stuff which is not too trivial to get past. So our second target I want to talk about, anyone have this? Okay, good. Two, three, you're good. Okay, so this is still ongoing. I haven't found any cool things with this, but um, I, I, it was part of a move and I budgeted to moving expenses, so I got to buy one of these. Uh, so there was an, an interesting port scan in that with the Wii move, there was ports open. There was uh, the port that I sent the command to, but this, there's no ports open. So I thought, well, how does this work, right? Well, here's the architecture. You have this cloud, this Nest cloud. Everything talks to the cloud. Even my phone in the same household will talk to the cloud and the cloud back to my device. It's like, great, right? Security, awesome. You have one device who controls everything. It's authoritative, awesome. No. And then you see this. So the thermostat, as a convenience to our users, we're gonna update you automatically. You don't have to click check for updates. There's no retraction. It's just whatever we put out, your thermostat's gonna update automatically. So what if someone hijacks this cloud and puts a bad firmware, which I just showed you that it's possible, and you turn all these devices into you know, your slaves? <laughs> and that's the problem, is that this is basically a single point of failure. Protect your cloud. Uh, yeah, don't, don't trust it, and maybe remove this automatic update, because you know, we've seen it before. Microsoft, I think, just recently had a bad update. Imagine if all your computers updated to that, and they, they blue screen to death or something. So yeah, that's it. Uh, so wrap up. Uh, I'm doing more work in embedded Linux. I want to understand uh, the security implications as they move, because the Samsung TV also has a Linux on there. What are the, the implications of putting this on just any device? My dishwasher, my washer and dryer. Uh, it's kind of like the, the SCADA or ICS issue where you're just putting soft, you know, you're putting the stack on these devices and not caring about protecting it. Uh, these people helped me out a lot, Dean and Mickey, on uh, different aspects of the, the project, so thank them. And thanks to Orcon. This is actually my first con to be to and to speak to. So thank you guys for having me here. And that's it.